Here we are. Um, good afternoon. I'm Paula Fryermuth. I'm a teacher with the Osseo AB program, and I teach adult diploma and GED prep stuff. So I'm the facilitator of this panel. I am not an expert in teaching science, even though I have to teach science. I muddle through. Um, but we have three people with us today that are very good at teaching science because I kept hearing their names when I was asking, who should I ask to be on the panel? These three names kept coming up. So I'd like to introduce them. And as each, before I do that, a reminder to myself, if you have any questions that you wanna ask any specific panelist or just in general about science, please chat them and we will try and get through them and go back to them. And Jody's gonna help out with that. Um, so let's move on. So if each panelist could go ahead, introduce themselves, say where they work and just sort of answer the question, how do you approach teaching science. Let's start with Sean. Yeah, I guess I'm first on the list there. Yeah, I'm Sean Scarborough, and uh, I, work for, I work with AUA uh, in Hibbing up in the northeast part of Minnesota. Uh, I'm in a one-room schoolhouse, so a lot of my approach to science is, is related to that. Um, Paula, I, I, I feel for you there, and I don't, I don't necessarily see myself as initially starting out as a science teacher, but I've been doing it here with GED and adult diploma for a while. And so I just, you know, I wanna, I wanna make it work. I wanna make it interesting for my students. I want them to Me too. enjoy it. So um, yeah, so, so that's where I'm starting from, but I kind of approach it from a, um, an English and math lens, I guess, um, where I see science as a great area to build knowledge for students. And so we can spend time um, you know, building knowledge around the concepts that are in there. There's a lot of complex text. There's a lot of technical vocabulary that we can get into. Um, there's a lot of data in the science stuff that we do. And so students can prove arguments and, and talk about hypotheses and that sort of thing. So, um, so those are all things I, I um, do with my students. But yeah, one room schoolhouse and uh, kind of approaching it from those perspectives. All right. Thank you, Sean. Um, the names are alphabetical by last name. That's why you were first. So let's go. Judy Trowbridge, would you introduce yourself, please? And how do you approach teaching science? Hi, I'm at the DOC in Faribault, the AAB, ABE program. Um, we don't get to use a lot of technology here. So we. I try to do project-based learning, but I have to do it old school. <laughs> so there's many things you can't bring into the DOC. So we, we find fun things to do. And I really like the environmental aspect of science. So we talk about that a lot. Thank you, Judy. Um, and let's go to Sarah Turnbull. Sarah? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so how do I approach teaching um, science? I'm sorry, I just kind of changed my view, Paula, and I'm a so-called expert with Zoom, not <laughs> exactly. Um, so anyway, I work with Andy Albee and Christine Kelly and John Traratola at uh, the Adult Academic Program in Robbinsdale. So we have a great team and we do a little bit of credit recovery we do a very tiny bit of adult diploma, but it's mostly GED. My approach to teaching science is that I, I like students to know that science is a process. It's a process of asking questions and understanding the natural world. Um, not a, a whole set of facts to, to memorize. Um, so kind of what Sean was saying about, you know, analyzing data and, um, you know, drawing conclusions and looking at um, studies, even that you run across in the news, uh, bring those in, talk about the, the um, kind of elements of the scientific process. And it just kind of reinforces some of that uh, terminology in kind of an easy, fun and relevant way. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, so um, each of the three panelists sent me a whole bunch of slides for the presentation, which I have had a very great time reading through and saying, oh, I can use that, I can use that. Um, so what I'd like to do next is just let them talk through what they shared. And, you know, some, you know, Judy has a lot of pictures on hers. Sarah has a lot of links and Sean has a mixture of everything on his. Um, so I just want to give them each a chance to kind of talk through it and let us know. And if you have questions about what they're saying and if panelists, if you could make sure and tell us where you got the idea. I saw some of Judy's things. I'm going like, how the heck do you know how to do that? Um, so like, where did that idea come from? Is there some place I can go look for it? Um, and um, participants, these notes and the slides will be available after the session. So you can go in and click on them through the slideshow here, through the link on the plat on your flyer. So um, let's start. Does anybody want, I'm gonna let you choose who wants to start first now. So in any particular order, does somebody wanna go first? Are you like my students and I have to call on you? <laughs> Just go alphabetical. Alphabetical again. So you're putting I think Judy's on. slides are, are first there, right? Oh, are, uh, are they? You're going to okay. pick on me again? Yeah, Judy's slides <laughs> are first in my deck. Um, yeah, you should go slide fine. order, I think. Okay. So, Judy, I'm going to ask you to take on the remote control and you're going to oh. have access to these. I'm going to get us there. All right. And if you can request remote control, I will grant it to you and you can go through the slides how you wish. Okay, now I'm not seeing where to request the remote control. Look for view options. Oh, at the top of your screen. Hmm. Oh. oh, there we go. Okay. Oops, I got to approve it. Sorry. Yeah. It's all yours. Thank you. Let's see. Yep. Oh, there we go. Um, it was hard to get Hot Wheels into the DOC, but we did get them. We counted them diligently when they returned. Here, the um, men are learning about speed and velocity. They're doing some graphing. Uh, we used Hot Wheels. I cut some mailing tubes in half. We used rulers. They used their books, their Common Core books, to change the elevation of the car, see if it, seeing if they could get different results. It was fun, and um, they really it was engaging for them, which is one thing that's hard to do. There's a lot of seat work in the DOC because we aren't able to use a lot of technology or um, bring in a lot of lot of tools. So this was a fun project for them. Here they're they're marking down, they're graphing, they're learning how to use stopwatches. That was something new for a lot of them. Um, so they had a really good time. They learned the formulas. Here we're working on law of motion. So they had some parameters. They had to build roller coasters and we used paper plates, tape and toilet paper tubes. So we collected toilet paper tubes for quite some time. They had to at least have their marble go through a loop, which was hard and it was fun to watch them troubleshoot with that. Here we're dissecting chicken wings um, to talk about muscles and ligaments. Of course, we can't have scalpels here, so we use just regular kindergarten scissors, which amazingly we did okay with. Um, yeah, they learned a lot about the anatomy of the arm, how the ligaments and muscles each work and where they're attached. Here they're using the, those same chicken wings to take a piece of the bone marrow and look at it under the microscope and logging what they see. Here we're looking at different bones that I was able to bring in. 
um, they have to try to figure out what area it's from in the body and they're, they're logging what bones um, they have in their own body. There was one, um, you, one station where they had to go through A to Z and find a bone where it was in the body and do it alphabetically. So that was, that was fun. That was hard for them. Jody, Judy, oh. I'm going to stop you a second. Yeah. Where, did you, where did you get the bones? Um, I've collected them on walks out in the woods. Okay. So I'm yeah. like, I have bones? How do I get bones? <laughs> yeah, you can find a lot if you go in the woods. Okay. There's a lot of antlers that drop and you find a lot of bones out there if you find the right area. Um, here we yeah, it's, it's really hard in, here in Minneapolis to find bones unless they're human. <laughs> You, you'll have to go go to a quieter park and see if you can find anything. Here they were looking at parts of the mouth in fetal pigs that we got. And again, you see we're using um, kindergarten scissors to do our, our uh, autopsy or our, um, cutting of the pig here. It's a fetal pig. I was able to get them at for relatively inexpensive at the homeschool science. And they had to do measuring and they had to write and follow instructions. That's a, a difficult task. Okay. Um, the, oh, go ahead. There was a question about where did you get the pigs? And you said homeschool science. That's a, a website where you can order products from? Yep. Okay. And somebody else gave me the suggestion to look for a squirrel thawing out in the snow, and that's where I can find my bones. So I'll there you go. get squirrels this spring. Okay, thank you. You you can also use bones that you've you've uh, I've brought in um, from a pork roast. I've brought in from the turkey, the vertebrae of the turkey. Uh, so you can find them just by cooking. These are tornado houses that they made out of just a bunch of scrap stuff we had in tape. So they had to make their tornado house and they moved the industrial fan um, to different lengths away from the tornado house to see if it would, it would uh, survive. Our biome project, they had to pick a biome. They had to talk about the water cycle, how that works. And, they had to uh, talk about six different plants, six different animals, and show where their biome was in the world. And then we do a solar system project where they have to make sure they have all the planets. They have to describe the sun, the, the distance of the planets from the sun, what a meteor, comet, and asteroid is. They enjoy that. I think they learn more when they have to investigate. Mm -hmm. And here we, uh, they all liked this because they all have children. We did the absorbency experiment, which diaper is more absorbent and Pampers lost. I was surprised. So that's the experiment. So if you have any questions. Okay. Does, yes. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I have a suggestion for bones. Um, Chris Klaus is asking, do you have any instructions and rubrics for these projects available? Oh, I do have rubrics for them. I could definitely put them online or if you give, um, send me your email, I could send them to you. Or Judy, if you could send them to me today, I'll add them to this um, slideshow sure. and they will be available to everybody. Sure, I won't be able to send them till Monday though. Okay. Sorry. Um, I'll figure out a way to get it in the slideshow so people can access it. Okay. It's okay. a good question, very helpful. Okay, um, so are we going to, well, Sarah's next in here. Um, okay. So, uh, let's see. You need to ask for remote control. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Judy. By the way, that was very interesting. Yeah. I love watching the guys do science. Enjoy. 
Terrific, Judy. That looked like so much fun. And it brought back, you know, I used to get the fetal pigs too. Um, and I've kind of gone the route of uh, owl pellets for oh. little skeletons. Um, but then of course, you know, that bypasses all those good body systems. So the fetal pigs, that's, that's good too. Um, so let's proceed. Can I? You should just be able to click or use the arrow buttons on your keyboard to move forward. Huh, it's not working. Um, I'm not getting a forward and I can't seem to just. Have, have you requested remote control? I'm going to turn it off and then you can turn it back on. I'm waiting for Sarah to control my screen. Okay. Okay. Right. Wait a minute. Stop. Oh. Oops. Wait a minute. Oops. I turned you off. I turned me off. Okay. So could you request again, Sarah? Okay. Um, and Paula, you can reshare again. Oh, it's not sharing. Oh, geez. Okay. People, I have so much trouble. Okay. My students all laugh at me during the day. And I'm trying to remember where I do this. Okay. Even though I've been doing virtual teaching for a year, I still don't know what I'm doing. Um, there we go. Share screen. Share. Okay. okay. Present. And then um, I'm requesting. Okay. And here we go. I'm approving. All right. Now, sh should I simply do, I mean, the down arrow isn't working. Try the right. Try right, right, left arrow. Oh, right. That's not working either. Ooh. -ooh. Okay, Paula, if you just go ahead and advance yeah. slides for her, Sarah, just let her know when you need to advance yeah. a slide. Thank you. Yeah. Because it's letting, sure. okay, so here we go. Okay. So I'll go to your first one. That's what you just sent me this morning, okay? Yeah, um, just, a, just a couple of things, not to, this is more for, for me to have a sense of some points I wanna make, but I do teach by the big ideas in science, the theories of science, and um, you know, you can bring in personalities, um, you know, from Darwin to Watson and Crick and just a little bit about some of the, their roles they've played um, in their particular field. Um, I do like to do a lot of questioning. So whether it's an essential question or two or having students generate questions, um, I think is, is good. Um, I love models using different like physical models to illustrate concepts. Um, lots of graphics for analysis. Um, I'm really trying to flip the classroom. And this is after, I mean, just a little bit, baby steps, right? But this was after listening to Joey Lehrman. I thought he was so terrific. So I, I try to send either like a Khan Academy video or a, um, maybe one of their articles, some, some um, thing to have the students look over ahead of time to at least um, get some interest um, and, and buy-in and maybe even get some of the vocab to, to start out. Um, uh, a messaging system, uh, we, at night we use Remind so we don't have that going for the day classes, but it has made things a lot easier to just send a mass remind message and, and link documents or, um, as well. Um, I try to keep up with my record of student contacts because I think that keeps me sane. Um, students like it when I include a GED practice question or two. And then um, if I'm able to have time for an exit ticket. Terrific. Um, forward, please. Okay. Um, you know, I mentioned science, the scientific process um, kind of, I think, forms the basis of 
of a lot of the GED tests. Amy Brown is, is one of the gals that um, I like on Teachers Pay Teachers, and this is a free download for her um, PowerPoint and five-page student notes. And I, I even uh, will have students, even if they're pretty close to testing in science, I'll say, be sure and go through the PowerPoint with the basic vocab, you know, the uh, and examples. Um, I mean, she's just terrific. Uh, for projects, um, she, the, her food chains and food webs and energy pyramid is great stuff. Um, another project for adult diploma could be hereditary or environment. Um, so um, that's, that's a good one as well. Um, then I just included, because on the GED, you know, they want you to know the independent and the dependent variables. So there's a nice um, free download uh, also at Teachers Pay Teachers. Okay, um, I mentioned a lot of questioning and I don't know if anyone has used, this technique has been around for a while. It's called uh, the QFT, questioning, question formulation technique. And it's, I got kind of excited about it a few years back. And now every so often I will do it at the beginning or use it at the beginning of a um, new unit. And so for example, uh, genetics, I threw up this question focus. It's a statement that you start with. DNA is called the code of life. And then you have your students in groups and then they, they, they go beyond just a brainstorm. They um, determine after they create that list, which are closed, which are open-ended questions. They modify those questions. They prioritize, and and so it's it it uh, is kind of a nice way to um, to get things going with a new unit, and it's uh, called the right question is um, the website. But it's uh, it's uh, kind of a fun thing to try if you haven't yet done that. Okay, thank you. Um, this uh, ASAP science has a couple of just darling guys and they do th these videos are just terrific. And this was one last fall that we did. So I just picked some random slides to kind of illustrate, you know, some of, of um, the points I wanted to make. But for example, mask or no mask. And so they do their own experiment at home with their Petri dishes, and then they um, mask and unmask. And of course, they're not able to measure virus, but they're able to indirectly measure um, through the droplets and the colonies that they grow on their little Petri dishes. And so um, then they even are connected with a couple of scientists in the lab that do a more refined study. So we could just do those different parts that they would need to know for the GED test. You know, what might have been a hypothesis? You know, what are the variables, a control group? What can you conclude? Then I added, will, your will this experiment affect your behavior? So that was back in the day when not everyone was wearing masks. But anyway, ASAP science is really fun. So Paula, thank you. Um, Analyzing data, drawing conclusions. This is just a little more practice on, on that. And, um, you know, the students get pretty good at, at analyzing the data. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen, well, I bet you have, but it's, um, it's a feature in the New York Times Learning Network and what's going on in this graph. And so every so often, I'll pull one of these out. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Um, it's an interactive thing. Students could even type in and respond the first week of a new graph at the site and see what other people are saying. And then a week later, uh, the US statistical blah, 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 um, they, they give more in-depth in information. 
and to talk about how the study, how the information was collected and, and more just about the, the study. So um, this is kind of fun. What's going on in this graph? Um, I started with, prior to that, with my star group, what's going on in this picture? And that was, you know, five years ago, or I don't know, a couple of years ago, whatever it was. And then um, this is a newer development, the, the graph, graphic. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, this is a oldie but goodie, root tips in the cell cycle. Everybody should do it for their students. Um, just because they are looking under, they're looking at photomicrographs. So these cells in different stages of the division, and they're they're taking notes. They're learning things first. Then they're then they're looking at the actual um, photomicrograph, and they're saying, "What stage is this in?" Based on what I know now, and so they have to do that with 36 different cells. And then, um, and, uh, then they even do a little math. So about um, the cell cycle and how much time was spent in interphase and how much time in metaphase and so on. So this is a, an oldie but a goodie. Um, proceed. Um, another point I want to make is, and probably most people agree, if you can kind of personalize things, you're going to get that interest and buy-in. This is something that I just ran across at a website I've used many times. There's so many genetics websites out there that are great. But this one, I happened to visit it recently and I saw this new activity, which is about the epigenome. So it looks at behaviors. So students can, can kind of analyze their own diet and exercise and stress. And you get into that conversation about nature, nurture, and how much, you know, are we, are we a product of our genetics only? And so it's, it's kind of a fun thing I like to, I think is important. Uh, Sarah, have you used this one with the students yet? I haven't, Paula, because I just found it. That would be interesting to find out how they react to the questions and the activity. Yes, yeah. Um, and then I just wanted to include this. I it, This was in the news and Andy, I know, saw it. Um, one year on a beaver pond in northern Minnesota. It is so terrific. It's the cameras going you've got six minutes of watching all these critters that they've edited it down to six minutes. And, you know, I also try to, I find that with a lot of the immigrants, they, they don't know anything about Minnesota, nothing about the North Woods. Um, and so I, I just wanted to make the point that when I can, and this just going through some ecology was a perfect time to do it. And then um, I also noticed that the National Geographic site um, had a, has a, uh, a section on the beaver as a keystone species. So that was kind of neat. Also, Hamlin has a terrific uh, Center for Global Environmental Education. And so um, they also have some classes. I took a nature journaling class with them one time. Um, so anyway, yay, Minnesota. Uh, one, one more, I think. Um, this one or the next one? The next one, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so I just wanted to show this as one of the terrific graphs that are provided by climate generation. So climate gen is uh, run through the University of Minnesota, started by Will Steger. He's, he mm -hmm. knows in the Arctic, you know, the changes. And so he is all behind this real push for climate education. And this graphic, um, they have is one like a dozen that are just fantastic. And you can give, you know, to a few different students, give them different graphics to analyze and, and share with the group. But the other thing they do with, the, with this is they have six versions of it where they've separated 
the dates into six segments. So I gave those out to six different groups. And then they, they, they look at the time frame. they make their observations. Then we taped it up on the board with everybody connected and looked at the complete picture for this time frame. And so they've got some terrific stuff. And you can, I did uh, a couple of years ago, went through their summer three-day um, kind of an institute uh, called uh, Climate Generation. So it's, it's, I think I have, I was so excited after I attended, I thought I could teach science completely within the framework of climate change. It never happened, <laughs> but, but it was a, a thought that I had that would be cool. I think that might be it, Paula. Yep, I have some TED Ed that some of my favorites, these are terrific. There's one on the science of skin color um, and just all kinds. This is the science of macaroni salad about uh, elements and molecules and it's terrific. So I like TED Ed too. Um, but I think that's, um, you know, we don't, we're not doing in person, but when we do, there are a few things that I like to do. Um, and um, so usually it requires some minimal uh, supplies. Judy has been much more resourceful, I would say, but um, anyway, kind of fun. And then I'll go ahead and include, these were just a, some of the links for my different units. And I think there's one more slide too. But um, I know that's a bit overwhelming, but if people want that stuff, um, you're welcome to, to have it or ignore it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Does anybody have any questions for Sarah right now? This is a lot of resources. This is great. <laughs> um, so there is a, a request for any suggestions for YouTube channels for consistent videos. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, things with scientists who are women or people of color in particular. Yeah. Oh, they just had the most, um, oh, I know. So they made, I'm trying to think. One <clears throat> of the scientists that's been working on the vaccine is African-American, African-American woman. Um, her name is something like Kenzie, Kizzy, something like that. Anyway, so I did kind of highlight a, a resource to use her. The other thing that they had uh, with my students, just to introduce her, um, another thing they had recently was, um, oh, his name is Percy. Percy, I can't think of his last name, African-American chemist. And that was just on PBS. He is so terrific. And they have a, a short segment of on his him and his science um, and how some of the challenges he faced. And that's on pbslearningmedia.org. So I use that a lot. Um, but I think there's so much on YouTube. And like that Joey Lehrman was suggesting with flipping the classroom just to find just type in your subject and your topic and you'll find some great videos. Another um, thing that came up in chat as a resource is using Crash Course. If Thank you, Angela. That. I've looked at for social studies, but I haven't done it for science. Um, is, that, is that the guy, a young guy who is talking about science? Really, really fast, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll just jump in. It is he talks very fast. He has a lot of sarcasm. Um, that's why I always have to teach my students to use the transcript so they can read along or stop him and then go back and read again while they're doing it. But there's a lot of worksheets available for those too. Um, okay. A couple more questions. Um, so you mentioned the scientist Percy is the name Percy Julian. Yes, thank you, Angela. As oh. that is so I could not stop watching the entire long version, but you can get a short little bio on PBS Learning Media. Um, and is Crash Course available on YouTube? That's the only place I found it. So <laughs> yes, it is. Um, and Chelsea says that you can slow down the speed, but then it sounds like the speaker is under the influence of something. So 
probably don't want to do that. So the transcript idea is sort of the best one. Like get them, get the transcript, have the students read along and keep discussing things. And we've got the Miracle of Life movie is another- That's episode. available on YouTube. Yes. Okay. So again, the idea of just going into and Google whatever you're looking for, things pop up that you just go like, oh, didn't know that. Okay. Any other questions before we head on? Angela oh, sent us a link, yes. Oh, thank you. Could you go back one slide? I just wanna make this point under climate change. The climate generation curriculum was what I was referencing when I showed the, um, the graph um, of, you know, from 1900 to today, as far as uh, temperature. And that curriculum, I believe is a free download. Um, so, and I chose the grades six to eight, but it's all aligned with the next generation science standards. And so it's, it's, it could give you a lot of good ideas as well as those graphics, which are so great. And we have the link that Angela sent is an example of a crash course video. So if you're interested in seeing what they are like, there's a quick link that you can check them out. Okay. Um, and there's Bozeman Science from YouTube. And Darcy says that the speaker speaks clearly and slowly. I love those. Um, <laughs> my second language learners or my non-native English speakers they need that because we usually watch videos two or three times before we're understanding what we've got. Okay, so let's move on and see if Sean wants to take over control. Give it a shot. Let's see if I can figure this out. Okay, yes. All right. All right, I took over control. Yeah, yeah, I just, um, I just want to say about Sarah, what Sarah had said, I think a lot of similarities, you know, um, if you're, if you're trying to figure out what do I teach, where do I get resources, I think that essential question is a good place to start. If you, if you start with a, a question that you have, or, a, you know, something you're curious about, uh, the students will be curious about it, too. I think especially, you know, the more you do it, I think the easier it gets to come up with those questions. And so, if you build around that question, I think they're they're more engaged with whatever it is you're, you're looking for. And then also, you know, um, if you just you start searching for that question, you're going to find articles, you're going to see it in the news, you're going to find YouTube videos, and you can bring those together into uh, some classes pretty, pretty quickly. Definitely try. I try to get those GED test questions in there because the students want to, if they're GED students, they're like, wait, is this on the GED? You know, so... so like, no, this is, you see, this question is, is where that would come into play and, and how having some background knowledge about this is going to help you um, with that. And like you said, personalizing it, making it interesting for them. That's, I think the things that I um, have here kind of fall into those categories. I tried to focus on a few things that um, met some of my criteria for what I'm trying to do in class. Uh, I'm in a one-room schoolhouse. So I love to do big experiments and things like that. But some days you have one student and then you have a different student the next day. And, and so it, it's, it does get challenging to do like a multi-day project or something like that. So it, for the one room schoolhouse, what I'm looking for is projects that um, it, it can work asynchronously or it can work if you're not there every day, you can come back to it. Something like that um, is, is something that I'm looking for. I'm definitely looking for things that are, are interesting. The good thing about one room schoolhouse is that because of that, that nature of things, it, it does play well with, um, with online learning, I think, just to some extent, is in that we have a similar kind of thing going on right now where it's, it's not necessarily everybody's there all the time. But um, yeah, that's, um, so let me just jump into some of the things. Um, I'd say, you know, one of the things I was trying to do, like I said, is get some kind of asynchronous um, thing going or something that would work in a one room schoolhouse where we could talk about it together. We could have it as a project we're working on together, perhaps. 
but if somebody needed to work on it at home or something like that they, they could um something that would work even distance learning as long as that person has a computer um so uh what i'm sharing with you today are mostly my successes and that's like on top of lots of attempts at things and trying to find things that that work and that are doable and that sort of thing um, I found this project on the Teach Engineering website, which is great. It just has it has a lot of projects, all different grade levels and things like that, um, where you 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 use Google Earth to and I've used this for adult diploma to um, a, a few different times to uh, meet the part of the the um, Earth and Space Science um, area. So. Um, so you need to have Google Earth on a computer, which you think would be maybe difficult. If you don't have any technology, it's not going to work. But we have old computers in my classroom, and they they run Google Earth Pro just fine. So if you can install something on a computer, you're good to go. Google gave this away like a, a few years ago, so you used to pay for it, but it's free now. And so this Teach Engineering um, uh, <clears throat> project uh, actually gives you real data. Uh, of all the hurricanes and tornadoes in the United States. And you can import that data to Google Earth. Uh, so I have the students do all that. I have them, if there's no Google Earth on their computer, we'll install it and they'll play around with Google Earth, which is just kind of fun, uh, just in the first place. And you're, you can move the Earth around, you can zoom in to your neighborhood or somebody you knows, you know, house or something like that. Um, it's just a program that you can, you can download. It doesn't have all these lines on it, these yellow and red uh, lines, that's the data. So we import the data, which you can download from the Teach Engineering website, it's just a zip file and it has instructions for how you install it. So I give those instructions to the students and say, you know, go wild with that, look at it. And then we start talking about what it means and that sort of thing. But what they, where we're going with this, and, and this is the teach engineering, this is their idea, but I, I built it into something that worked for my classroom. So I have a packet that has all the instructions for all the different steps. So students miss something, we can come back to that, resume where we left off and, and that sort of thing. Um, but their end goal is to answer the question, the, um, the state government is deciding um, the, the funding for disaster relief in whatever area that you're going to look into. And um, <clears throat> they've, they've decided that either there are fewer tornadoes or fewer hurricanes in the area over the last 10 years. So we're going to decrease the amount of disaster relief funding that's available in our state. And your job is to decide as a scientist, is that a good idea? Should we do that? And so they have to go and look at the data See, so most, most of my students pick like the Minneapolis area or something like that because they're curious about that. Uh, sometimes they'll pick up north and realize there, there, there are very few tornadoes um, where, where, we, <laughs> where I'm at. Um, but um, the Minneapolis area is really interesting for them. And so they'll um, you know, collect data, how many tornadoes there were, how severe they, they were. And then they'll make charts from that data and they'll, they'll write a paper. Um, about, uh, and, that, and that paper is an argumentative essay uh, arguing whether or not, you know, this funding should be decreased or, or, or not uh, based on the data. So it's, it's something that's, I don't know, it's, it's worked with all my students so far because it, it's really different from anything they've done. It's kind of, seems kind of techie, but it's not really very, very techie, but it seems kind of fun for them. They're like, whoa, you know, I can look at all these tornadoes and I have to pick a radius. Uh, and so, it's collecting data, it's making arguments, um, it's real. They can choose anywhere they want. If they move to this area, they can look back at another place that they live. So I've had a lot of fun with it. Um, it works in a one-room schoolhouse. It would definitely work for a classroom if you had enough. I mean, you could do it as a group. You could do it, um, you know, if you have enough computers or technology to be able to do that. So um, that's, that's one that I've, I've done that I really, really had a lot of fun with, um, with my students. Um, so. That meets some of my criteria. Um, another thing I'm looking for, and, and that's why I share these, these resources, is um, things that are kind of ready to go as far as CCRS and that sort of thing, and that are kind of engaging. So Chem Matters is a magazine that's free, pretty much free to download. You can download their um, 
articles and um, a whole bunch of CCRS aligned resources that go with them. And they're meant for uh, high school students. So typically they're pretty engaging. Sometimes they might be like, I, I, I read through the topics, but they have like several years worth of them that you can go back and look at. So this one is about um, myths about protein and, you know, should I, should I eat a whole bunch of protein to bulk up um, and that sort of thing. And so through that, uh, we learn about the body, about proteins. It's like a two or three page article. And there's a bunch of stuff that goes along with it. You've got, um, you know, I just cut part of these pages off, but the anticipation guide there is like a pre-reading thing, um, arguments that I think the, the article is going to uh, say yes or no, or you agree or disagree with these arguments before the article. And then we go back to the text and look and see, did they, did the article agree or disagree with that? They have graphic organizers that help with different things. It's, it's different depending on what the topic is. Um, and then they're reading comprehension questions, which are text dependent questions. It's all pre-made, ready to go for you there um, on Chem Matters. So I really like this site. Um, it is, a, some of the readings are very challenging. So just be aware that you want, you want to read them before you give them to your students, you want to know the level of your students, but um, plenty of them are good for GED students. Um, uh, to be to be working on and there there's a lot of engaging or interesting topics we can learn stuff about science a lot of visuals we can look at the graphs and that sort of thing so that's a resource that I, I like mainly just because it's it's ready to go for you which is not always the case with uh, with the one room schoolhouse kind of situation and then uh, people were asking about about YouTube um, and easy uh, so I, I love crash course I love crash course but it is like way too fast for many of my students. And I can't, they can't understand. Like I asked some questions about the video, you know, I've, I've, I've used some for social studies too. Um, and they just, so much goes over their head about it. And, it, and you're right about the sarcasm and stuff like that. That's like, that doesn't always get picked up on. Um, even for first language learners, I, I think it's, it's, it doesn't always, it doesn't always work. So I'm um, with online learning, um, Right now, I'm looking for resources I can share with my students if they if they missed a class, if they need to work on something while I'm working with another student. Uh, I'm trying to find resources that they can use where they they don't have to have as much support, where the, the person is explaining it clearly, simply step by step and slowly. Um, so I wanted to share this one for the GD because a lot of times um, perhaps you're teaching students about chemical reactions and um, balancing chemical equations. Tyler DeWitt has a million subscribers as a teacher for a reason, I think. He's really, really good at explaining chemical equations slowly and carefully and with enthusiasm. Um, so I, I'd highly recommend him. He's, he is a, a, a white guy, but he does do a good job explaining um, I, I haven't found a better resource for chem, chemical equations. He does talk about some other topics. That's not really what I've been using him for, but he probably would be good um, in those areas as well. But he is a YouTube person who I would, I would recommend um, just for the, the situation that we're in now. And even I think a lot of these things I'm doing with uh, online learning, I'm gonna continue making use of even, even when I'm meeting most of my students in person again. So, um, I tried to focus on some of the things I found the most successful. I, if you have questions or you want me to share more links with you, I can do that. I just kind of put some things on here of places that I often go looking for projects, looking for ideas, things to spread me out. So that's, that's kind um, of. Okay, a couple of things. One, I have a question about CK-12 because I have been in CK-12 a lot and I'm wondering what you or anybody else thinks of it as a resource. <sighs> yeah, it's, it is a, it is a good resource, I think, but it it's it requires my students to be too tech savvy sometimes. It's like not always easy to navigate those the the sites. So I try to I try to link to individual lessons, individual videos, things like that. I, I don't use CK12 itself for like putting together a textbook or things like that. But I yes, I I like stuff on there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I pull things from there. I find yep. my videos on there. 
Um, Chris mentions the Plix activities. There are, there are practice yeah, questions, but trying to give them the whole. Yeah, I don't do that. Yeah. yeah, I do use it a lot for math because I don't know how to teach math either, but mm -hmm. um, I'm teaching it. So um, I'm going to go back to some of the things in the chat over here. And um, again, Chris Kloss, oops, so I'm going to take that control. Um, Chris Kloss had a good question and suggestion about could we put our resources in some place together? Have some sort of list of vetted YouTube videos because it takes so long to vet them. And it's a good suggestion and it's something I'm gonna bring back for um, Atlas because that was a suggestion and it's good. So like even the ones we have started with now, it'd be good to get them in one place with some sort of, here's the category. And it could also address the issue of doing, you know, scientists or people of color or non-males and some sort of notation so that we can start seeing some diversity in who's doing the science videos. Um, but in response to Chris's question, Sarah had an answer about PBS media, I think. So Sarah, could you talk about that? What do you do with that? What is that good for? Yeah, um, Paula, you were the one who got me started because that was called Teacher's Domain. And years ago, I went to something that you, uh, you presented down at the Eisenhower Center and you told me about Teacher's Domain and it has now become PBS Learning Media. And I just, over time, I have collected just a heck of a lot of videos. They've got a great little um, interactive on the structure of the atom. So I have my little chemistry folder and I have my ecology folder and my cell biology folder. So you just, it's so easy. And, and I can kind of thank you for that, Paula. It's really terrific stuff. Sarah, I wanna go back, you said your folder. So could you explain what that is a little more? Yeah, so um, when you make an account, then you can create folders so that you can keep your, your uh, resources together. So I probably have at least a dozen folders, okay. cells to chemistry and so on. And it makes me kind of pretend that I'm organized in that one tiny little aspect of my life. <laughs> but it is something that, um, like people were saying, well, how can we, you know, sort through different YouTube videos? I guess I find that PBS uh, Learning Media is so great that you can probably find something there. Um, maybe not always. So I feel like things have kind of been maybe vetted, you know? when they appear uh, there. I also wanted to mention one, one more website, and I think it's in my unit notes about um, earth science, but it was, it's called the Big, Big History Project. I don't know if anyone has used that. How did it escape my attention? It's been around for, almost 10 years. And it was one of these uh, things started by Bill Gates. And it is looking to me like it is so amazing. And I found it by watching or getting referred from Khan Academy and seeing a video of a geologist talking about the tools that they use to study rocks. I mean, he's terrific. And then I ran across, it's called The Big History Project. Unbelievable, because it, I mean, it really goes back, Sean, you would dig it, because it goes way back, you know, to in a historical beginning of the cosmos, you know, beginning of, and all through time, from the Big Bang on. And I am so excited to use some of that uh, coming up. Okay. Thing I was um, going to mention one more th last thing is that I do, and I'm not great at always keeping it up to date, but 
John and I, in our evening classes, we do keep a website with, and then day students would have access to it as well, but with previous lessons. So there was the talk about trying to videotape and so we don't do that, but they can access our slideshows for the, for the various weeks. So we keep that up fairly updated. All right, going back into the chat because there's some interesting things coming up here. Um, Chris Kloss mentions that they use the Plix activities in CK12, which are virtual labs. And they are quite interesting. I've used some in math so students can figure out slope and they can see what's going on. And I don't have to figure it out ahead of time. That's what I like about it. Um, Chris, do you have anything else you want to say about the Plix activities? Um, I think that's pretty much the, the summary of it. Um, some of them are more open-ended where it'll give them some prompts of what to do and then um, I take sort of a notice and wonder approach where I have them sort of play around with it. And then I have some sort of guiding questions like a uh, few of you have mentioned uh, for students to sort of reflect on, like what, what did you notice when you were playing around with this? And then what questions does that bring up for you? And then we connect it back to whatever we're talking about that day. Um, and some of them are less open-ended. It kind of like takes them step-by-step step through an activity and then gives them some multiple choice or uh, discussion open-ended types of questions to think about. And um, it's just another way to, especially during virtual learning, make it a little bit more engaging where, um, you know, I, I'm not just like talking at them or begging them to turn their mics on, but they're actually doing something in class. Um, Judy Needham has a very good question. Are there favorite resources that we can count proxy hours for? Great question. Does anybody have an answer? Uh-oh. I was just gonna say there are so many terrific uh, genetics uh, websites that, that I use and, and with, live with animations and little tutorials and, and they're so good, but the only one that, um, that I seemed, I mean, Khan, I think is one that you can get the proxy hours, but I don't know of, of others other than the standard ones, you know, Edmentum and so on. Well, and remember now with mm -hmm. what they discussed this morning uh, of being able to become the uh, TVM person uh, and being able to create lessons and then show how you're recording the hours that if you get certified, then you can use some of those people, uh, some of those other programs and just set it up under your own system to count the hours. Yeah, and I'm very hopeful for that because the collective intelligence of all of us is so astronomical. Somebody has the answer to every question. You just have to find the somebody. Um, and this is a good way to find it, having these teacher lessons, not not complete courses, but a lesson. If they do this, they get five hours. Thank you, I want that very much. Mm -hmm. Any other comments about proxy hours and sites for that? Okay. Yeah, I would just agree with yeah. what's been said and that my, my hope is to have all of my coursework in a way that, mm -hmm. you know, that we can count it yeah. all completely configured in. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm working towards. <clears throat> Um, Judy gave an, a link to another activity that this is the first one I heard about that she did. Um, it's the science journal for kids. It can be adapted for adult students, she says. But the experiment that I heard about and she referenced here is making poop. Yeah, they loved that experiment. And it's a one day. It's, it's fun. It's just a one day experiment and you learn about the digestive system. Nice. It sounded gross, but wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> they all thought it was gross. Grown men thought it was disgusting. Right. Um, and Chris Kloss is building a YouTube channel, of a collection to subscribe to. And I think when they get done with that, we are all going to want a copy to know yeah. what those are. So keeping a good list of our resources, hopefully through Atlas, that we can go to and say, I'm looking for 
and there's something. There is a lot of stuff out there for science. It takes a long time to wade through it all, to find the stuff that is good and the stuff that can work in our adult education settings, particularly now that they're virtual and we have no money. So how do we do something free with students who don't always have the best technology? So if we can help each other out, we'll be doing a good job for each other. Um, Sarah, remember the name of that uh, virologist at the CDC, Kismikia Corbett? Mm -hmm. um, Chris, who must be an excellent science teacher, they, she, they found a channel that said on with a speaker who speaks very slowly. It's also Fuse School. The Kaplan book is an approved DL curriculum. So if you're looking for Kaplan, that's a, it's a book and not a technology base, but it is available for proxy hour counting. There's great science in there. Um, let's see, yes, we want resources. We need to get a science area. I was just looking through, somebody asked about uh, ordering fetal pigs, and I think I have ordered them through Trans Mississippi Biological in uh, St. Paul, but I just went to their website and I'm, for some reason, I'm not seeing it. So I don't know if they don't have them anymore, but um, you know, you can, that, that's kind of a good place if you need, um, and this is for Judy, you could buy some inexpensive scalpels, Judy, unless you want to continue to use your scissors, which is, that, that's true. Yes, we can't have scalpels in the DOC. Oh, you're right. Oh, yeah. now that I think about it, yeah. Even for our regular students, I mean, yeah. Um, Sean, there's a request that you talk about a curriculum map if you have one that shows the math standards you're integrating with the science ones, do you have something like that? No, I don't. Oh. <laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm doing it myself, I guess. Okay. I want to say, I want to say, I was just looking up to see, because I, I recall that I pulled the math standards on teach engineering from the assignment itself. I'm pretty sure, but I, I, I was just looking that up to see if that's really 100% true, but I'm pretty sure teach engineering has both the science and math standards for their projects that you're that it would meet, mm -hmm. but no, I'm I'm um, I don't feel like I've found a resource that is is doing what I need so far. So, so I've been. So kind of, I have a, I have a request. As soon as you get yours finished, would you share it with the rest of us so we can borrow? Sure. It? <laughs> sure. Yes. Okay. Um, are there other questions or comments anybody wants to make about anything that's up there? on science, the big history project again with from Bill Gates. Um, I think we have time for just another question. And so I wanna ask our panelists, what has been your biggest challenging, biggest challenge teaching science and how have you overcome it? Do you mean since, I mean, as far as- I think any- in person or online, what has been your biggest challenge with teaching science to the group you're teaching? We have three good examples here. We have a DOC location, we have classes in an urban location, and we have a one-room schoolhouse location. All of them have challenges. So what has been your challenge with teaching science and how do you deal with it? The biggest challenge for me at the DOC is being able to bring things or use tools. A lot of things aren't permitted in the DOC. So that's been a challenge and it's, you wanna make it engaging for the students, yet I have to comply with safety issues. So that's been probably the biggest challenge here. Okay, that's good to know. And you had some nice substitutions using child scissors instead of scalpels, which I would have to do in my building, even though I work in a public school, they will would not let me bring a scalpel into where I work. So we'll get the child scissors. Sarah or Sean? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously the COVID and um, online stuff has been, a, has been a challenge. Maybe I'll come back to that. But I think just 
every day in a one room schoolhouse, um, the, the days vary so much. And so sometimes you have a cohort and a group that's working on science. And sometimes you just have one student who's we're really, you know, maybe everybody else has passed their science test. And so the last thing they want to do is do something that's not for their GED. Um, I think, I think that uh, the adult diploma is a partial solution. My adult diploma students have a different mindset about things than my GED students. Like, you know, they're willing to invest in a project that they're interested in and all this stuff because of because we can we can get the get there a different way than taking an exam. But I, I think I just trying to change the mindsets of, of my GED students. Um, so it's not just like, is this on the test? Why aren't we doing, you know, more practice questions? But so, you know, way, the way of fixing that is just, I mean, just trying to change the atmosphere of my classroom. And that's not always easy in one room schoolhouse because you're you've got different groups doing different things potentially. We try to get little cohorts going, but it doesn't always last. And so uh, I think some of the things are um, just like, like I mentioned, the essential questions, the engaging text, the things that apply to people's lives. And, and people are interested, you know, students are interested and they just kind of forget about those things. And they have that good experience with class and, you know, there's some buy-in there. And so overcoming that focus on the, t the test. I got to take the test as soon as I, I can. And it's all part of a holistic process of growing and learning. And, and that's going to get you ready for the test too. So that, that feels like my biggest challenge in a one-room schoolhouse. Sarah? I can think of two things um, this past year. So as we've been Zooming um, is getting students to join up with the group. And I think it does help that I send out that weekly, even if it's the same Zoom code, I send an invite um, and with the link, but also what we're gonna be covering. So whatever, uh, you know, unit kind of we're on right now, or maybe it's just some review kind of questions. Um, maybe it's a focus on graphics. Maybe it's a focus on math for the GED science test. So I think that helps to, to get the students to join up. I don't find them doing much homework. So I don't have a great system for that. I do use, oh, is it Reader's Press that has, it has a science and math little um, slim book. Um, I don't know if anyone uses that, but it, it's like the most concise um, background on a topic, like earth science in one page or plate tectonics in one page and then with a page of questions. So it gives them a little practice, but, um, and I try and, you know, sending, I'm sending them scan documents, you know, for them to do a little homework, uh, sometimes from the Kaplan book too, but I don't always hear back that they're doing that. Whether I get into Khan again for science, I never have used it consistently. Um, I have used it in math a little more. Um, so I'm still searching too, everybody. <laughs> um, and I found for getting students to do homework, my GED students don't, but my diploma students do because they know their diploma relies on it. If they don't do the homework, I don't sign off the credit. Okay. So the homework is a, an issue, I think, for all of us. Um, Judy just chatted another resource for EL students. The big bad, the no, big bad, the big fat book of science. Judy, can you tell us a little bit more about that? It's very easy reading, and it covers many, many science topics. And it's just it puts it in very simple terms, and the ELL students are able to understand from that better. Um, it's a book that's available at Barnes and Noble or anywhere. 
Walmart even. Oh, okay. Um, there's a question to clarify for Sarah. Are you using the purple book, Science for the GED Test, from the New Readers Press? Is that the one you're talking about? Um, the big, the big manual. No, I, I will draw from. Oh, New Readers Press. The, um, I call them pamphlet books, and it's like a purple cover. Um, I've got the big Kaplan purple one. Let me let me just uh, step away for a moment. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions, or comments? I think we're coming close to the end of our time. That's correct. We got about four minutes left. All right. So um, main thing we use at Adult Academic with Sarah is the Kaplan GED prep uh, book, and they you know put a new one out every year, so you know, the prep plus. Oh, she's got some of her other GD okay. science books there. So, so this, this is New Reader Press, but I haven't seen a purple one. And then this is, there's one for math. There's, there's one for English too. These, it's, it's, it's almost too bare bones, but it will give them some of the terminology and the, the basics. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions or resources or comments that people want to chat about or speak up and say? Because the resources we're seeing, it's like all of these resources are so appreciated. It's going to make me crazy going through all of them, but I will because I need help. Um, when I, and right now I'm not teaching science again until September. So I have a few months to look through everything and figure out how I can do it better. Does anybody in the audience have anything they wanna chat or ask our speaker before we wrap it up? Okay, so- um, I'm gonna add, just add that I'm very open to, you know, talking, um, you know, remotely or by phone or, or whatever. I, I'd love to meet for a cup of coffee, but I don't know if that <laughs> right mm -hmm. yet. Um, but if if people want to discuss some some simple supplies that you can order that have really um, worked well for me. Okay. Yeah. I, I raised my hand a moment ago. Yeah, Milo. I've had a really strange work day, so I didn't hear all of the discussion. I'm sorry for that. That's fine. Um, I really like the Steck Vaughn subject specific GED books for students who are almost ready, but I don't like their pre GED series very much. And I'm curious if people have experience working with students with the Learning Express books that I know you can download a free PDF if, with, with a library card. Does anybody have that? I've not heard of those. So I have anybody... them, but I, I haven't used them. Yeah, I don't, I don't use them very much. I feel like they have really long reading passages. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I like I have... that they're free. Yeah, yeah. The, the library does have free resources for all of the subjects that we teach, but sometimes, yeah, the quality isn't quite there. I was able to download all of those Learning Express things in, like, I don't know, on my computer, and then I threw it into my Google website. So students that maybe I'm not so sure about giving them resources as far as will I get it back, um, I'll invite them to use those online options, but I agree they're not the best. And some of them are available in Spanish. So I know a couple of people who, who have tutored who like using the Spanish language GED Learning Express books. Um, well, I think we're at the end of our time. I appreciate everybody being here. And remember, if you want this recording and seeing the notes from the chat and the slides, they will be available. The link to that is on your flyer and they should be available um, later today or next week so you can see those things. Andy, anything else we need to wrap it up? Oh, that is absolutely it. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy I'm the rest of your afternoon. Going to go ahead and chat that out with the links to the flyer and uh, everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you.
And can we talk at some point, and I love your, your background, by the way. Thank you. Um, can we talk about um, my group and why the students were having trouble with the new link, new Zoom? We can, we can try. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they're having troubles with the new link. I know I went to the new link and it works just fine. Were so, you saying something um, about it might be that someone is using an old, like they, correct. they saved? Okay. So, you know, when you open up a web page, it caches it on your computer. Mm -hmm. And so when you reopen it, it should go out and look to see, is there a new one? And if it's not, just use the old one. Well, if their computer hasn't gone out to see if there's a new one, if they have a cached uh, copy of that page on their computer, then they're still using the old link. Mm -hmm. So they just have to go through and and click the you know refresh their uh, their page, and it should bring the new link in. Okay. All right. Because poor Ibsa too, I felt so bad about her. But if you could be at the ready next Monday, I will. <laughs> I, I will. I love you, Andy. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'll see you then. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and close this off. Okay. Bye, Judy. Nice meeting you.